Welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Stephanie and this is our first virtual Sally class, our Senior Advocate Lifelong Learning Institute class for the spring semester. We are so excited. It has been so much fun the last few weeks. We've been doing practice sessions on Zoom. Um, I am learning right along with all the rest of you, so thanks for your patience in that. And um, we're just thrilled to start these series again. We miss seeing you all in person, but at least we're able to see your faces um, on the big screen. So what I'm gonna do right now is I'm going to mute everybody. Um, and then we will, because we have so many participants that are signed up for this, we wanna make sure that we don't hear any noise in the background. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. At the very end, I'll take you all off mute just so everybody can, can say hi. So let me go ahead and do that. And um, so we're thrilled for this uh, series in particular. Of course, we're going to be working, we're going to be talking about history bites. And we really wanted to, um, for both of these classes that we're doing, kind of partner with a local nonprofit. Um, you know, they all are struggling right now, um, as a lot of companies are, but especially they are because they are um, not able to get the funding. They're not able to have the people come through their doors. So I want to introduce Howard Hug III. He is the president and CEO of the Mariners Museum in Newport News. I know probably many of you are familiar with what they do, but I wanted to give him a couple of minutes just to talk about what they do, um, what they use their funding for, and um, give us a little bit of information and how are you guys holding up with all this stuff going on? Well, Stephanie, thanks for throwing the ball to me. It's a real honor to partner with you and, and to be a part of this Spring uh, Sally program. Uh, Stephanie has already demonstrated tremendous patience with me uh, over the last week or so, getting me uh, on board with these videos. And I'm really grateful that you're gonna give me an opportunity at the start of kind of each of these weekly sessions to say a word or two about the museum. And I'm also grateful for what Stephanie was just saying, that at the end of this uh, program, I think she's going to put up a link uh, that will show you where on our website you can go to provide support if you're uh, so interested. You're, you're exactly right. We, we are projecting to lose about $1 million in revenue this year because of the COVID response. Now, the good news is uh, we've done a very good job of managing our expenses. We've found some some alternative revenue to help offset that that, that, that we're losing. Um, and we've managed to keep our entire team together and keep uh, everyone paid. Uh, so we're doing well and we're pushing a lot more digital content that I'll share uh, more details about over the coming weeks. But what are we going to share today? Well, first, I thought it would be interesting for you to know because many people don't that in the late 90s, the US Congress designated the Mariners Museum and Park uh, as one of the two museums, the other being South Street Seaport in New York, that together comprise America's National Maritime Museum. So that's right, America's National Maritime Museum is located right here in our backyard in, uh, in the Hampton Roads region. And the other thing I wanted to share at the start of the program today is that four years ago, we committed to a new mission statement. And this is really what we're all about today. So we say now that the Mariners Museum and Park connects people to the world's waters because through the waters, through our shared maritime heritage, we're connected to one another. So we connect people to the world's waters because that's how we're connected to one another. And we think this is particularly relevant today because every single night I flip on the TV and I'm reminded of all of the forces that are tearing at the fabric of our community, right? Whether it's politics or extremism or uh, any, we could sit for hours and create a list, right? Of all of the things that seem to make us feel fractured as a community. But the museum has a really powerful narrative about how we're bound together as a community. And that's a shared, maritime heritage, it's a shared connection to the water that happens to cut across race, ethnicity, gender, age, socioeconomic status, all of the ways that sometimes we feel different from one another. Um, this connection to the water really binds us together. And one of the people who has really taken the lead on promoting that narrative, on getting the word out about the museum and about this shared maritime heritage has been John Corstein. 
And uh, it's really my honor and privilege uh, to introduce John today and, and to hand the ball over to him. I'm gonna work more about his bio into the next several weeks uh, as I have the opportunity to, to toss the mic to him. Um, but for today, I think it's really important to know that he is the Director Emeritus of the USS Monitor Center uh, at the Mariners Museum. And many of you know John uh, every bit as well as I do and know that uh, there is no better storyteller on the face of the planet. And today, uh, it's my honor to hand the ball over to, to you, John, and, and take it away. Excellent. Thank you, Howard. And I, um, I know, John, you're on here. Um, I just wanted to say one thing to the participants. Um, if you all go to the bottom of your screen, in the middle of the screen, there should be a chat button. If you click on that and you look to the right, you are able to actually type questions um, that we will ask John at the end of the presentation. So it's down in the bottom right hand corner. I'm going to type in hello to everyone right now. So you should see that I just typed hello. Um, you may want to wait till towards the end to type in your questions and write them down instead because he may end up answering them um, before the end of his presentation. But that's how we're gonna do questions. So just make sure you, you are able to use that feature. Um, and John, we love working with John. He's so funny. He's, he's uh, just got some great stories for us. And we thought, what a better way, you know, to start out this whole History Bite series than to start with scandals, something juicy and interesting and, and funny. So John, I'm going to give you the floor and, um, and I'm going to let you right on. I'm going to unmute everybody so that we can actually hear John. <laughs> And so are you back, John? My name is John Corsi, and of course, um, we're filming this uh, in my dining room, which is actually where I work on one of my books. I, I have one at the publisher right now, about ready to come out. Um, the two of the left of me is my book on Nat Turner, um, and which is almost done. And I have another book upstairs in my uh, study. So. <clears throat> and you'll see a bunch of maritime art behind me. I'm an avid decoy and waterfowl art collector as well as maritime art collector. And so uh, I'd like to welcome you to my home, which was actually the oldest house on the Lower Peninsula, built in 1757, known as the Herbert House. No scandals are here, but there are lots of scandals elsewhere in Virginia. I know that you all remember uh, Governor McDonald and his problems with uh, his wife being a little too greedy and patronage, et cetera. Uh, that's not the first time that's happened, I have to tell you. So let's start with some fun people. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, we all know and we all revere as the writer of the Declaration of Independence, as the uh, author of the Statute on Religious Freedom, governor of Virginia, president of the United States. Now he had some real skeletons in his closet. And the two that we'll talk about today happens to deal with his father-in-law, John Wales. John Wales was one of the wealthiest men in Virginia. Uh, he uh, was a slave trader as well as owning several plantations. And he had what we call a concubine known as Betty Hemings. Betty Hemings had six children with um, John Wales. Well, John Wales' white daughter is, of course, Martha Wales. And guess who she marries? She marries Thomas Jefferson. And going along with her, the dowry, as we would call it, would be Betty Hemings and her six children, one of which happens to be Sally Hemings. Now, I want to tell you, there's a sketch of Sally Hemings. There's a painting of Martha Jefferson. And you look at the two, and the only difference, really, is uh, the darker complexion that Sally has. But actually, by looks and everything, she was no different. <coughs> than Martha. Now, when Martha dies, she tells her husband that she didn't want him to marry again. Her father had been married three times. 
uh, the two prior wives have died. So she didn't like the idea of having a stepmother look over her children. So Jefferson said, sure, I'll do that. As he cast his eye over at Sally, virtually Martha's lookalike. In fact, he takes Sally to Paris with him. And you know, when she got to Paris, she was actually free. There was no slavery in France at the time. And as a result of that, she could have just said, well, I don't care about you, Mr. Jefferson. We don't know the conversation that went on between them, but somehow it was agreed that uh, she would stay with Jefferson and with him, she begat six children, believe it or not. And they would have been three-fourths white, you know, based on the father-in-law and then based on Jefferson's involvement. So uh, it is one of those scan scandals that actually comes out in the election of uh, 1804. You think we got scandals today in the election process? My goodness, we had a big time in 1804 because Jefferson, you know, this patriarch, this aristocrat basically uh, is, you know, I'm a good guy, and some people, uh, Joseph Callender is a man that actually had worked with Jefferson. Um, he was a newspaper man, and he had asked Jefferson that when he got reelected to name him, the first election, uh, to name him a postmaster uh, of Virginia. That's a lucrative sinecure, and Jefferson says no. So the next election came along, there are these pamphlets saying that Thomas Jefferson had a darker side to him. And that, uh, that's the accent words. And that, that was Sally Hemings, his concubine. And so this was a big stir, but actually in the South, uh, I have to say, you know, slavery is an evil institution. And whether you had a good master or a bad master, the idea, is that you are always under threat of violence, of sexual exploitation, et cetera. And Sally somehow accepted her position. Her room was actually just below Jefferson's bedroom, believe it or not. Uh, so that was a very convenient uh, situation. Now, Jefferson also had some other problems and his problems really was because he was a self-taught architect and as a self-taught architect he is working on his own house monticello i'm going to tell you right now it goes through four different major revisions and of course when you tear down a house and rebuild the house and tear it down again and rebuild it and then add some other stuff while you also have a house down in bedford county which is uh known as poplar forest, right, which is an octagonal house. And so Jefferson is a spendthrift of the highest order. So he, to get out of debt, sells his library to create the Library of Congress. That's how, what a brilliant man Jefferson was. However, those debts kept piling up left and right. In fact, he acted as security to Peyton Randolph, who borrowed money, I gotta tell you. And Randolph, guess what? He can't pay it back. And so that debt reverts to Jefferson. On his deathbed, Jeff now he was in debt for about eight years, heavily in debt to the tune of $100,000. And so, which today would be about $10 million. So, what is happening is that uh, Jefferson um, will, you know, no one calls in the debt. They just wait for him to die. And the day he dies, they all kind of converge on Monticello. Uh, they sell his 123 slaves. He has freed Sally, however, in his will. And, but his house is sold. Uh, his popular farce is sold. And fortunately, to people who recognize the importance of these buildings. So, what scandal does Jefferson have? He has a half African American mistress. 
he is a insolvent person. And, you know, now, you know, we ask questions about the president's financial well-being. Well, they asked that about Jefferson as well. And Jefferson kind of shrugged it off as if, well, that's just the way we planters live down here in Virginia. Well, I got to tell you, um, I'm going to tell you some stories of some planters right now. And one of my favorites is Henry Lee III. Now, Henry Lee III was a, uh, of course, born at Leesylvania, um, and uh, which is another Lee family um, home. I got to tell you, Henry Lee is first cousin of Richard Henry Lee, who's 12th president of the Continental Congress. He is related to Thomas Jefferson, to Thomas Nelson Jr. You know, we know the Nelson House in Yorktown. He uh, is actually noted to be related to Richard Bland. He's grandson of Henry Lee I. My goodness, this guy has the great connections. And when the Revolutionary War begins, he will actually, um, he will go uh, to war and he will become known as Light Horse Henry or Light Horse Harry Lee. Now, as Light Horse Harry Lee, he wins a gold medal from Congress for his actions at Paulus Hook that almost got him court-martialed, but instead uh, he received this gold medal. He is a hero in the Carolinas campaign uh, where he fights at Guilford Courthouse, places like Utah Springs. He put, fights guerrilla war with Francis Marion. This guy is a great cavalry officer, so much so that he is there at Yorktown at the request of George Washington with his legion known as the Lee's Legion. So here's a war hero. He stands right around six feet tall, which is rather tall for the time period. He is handsome. Uh, you could look up his painting, um, uh, his portrait uh, is just shows what a handsome guy he was. He was kind of a rake, we might say. So after the war, he needs to get married. So he goes after a proper wife. And that proper wife, his first wife, is going to be known as Matilda Ludwell Lee. And she is the heiress to Stratford Hall. So that's how Light Horse Harry Lee gets hold of Stratford Hall. Her dowry includes the plantation and a trust fund to pay for the workings of the plantation. Now, good old Light Horse Harry Lee uh, is not satisfied with that type of money. And so what does he do? Well, he uses his position as governor of Virginia. Now he's governor of Virginia uh, for uh, from... 1791 to 1794, and he uses that to begin land speculation out in the West, you know, gathering great property and so forth. Um, he becomes once again a hero because of the Whiskey Rebellion, which is in Western Pennsylvania. He <clears throat> commands all the militia troops that George Washington organizes to put down the rebellion. He does so in a fascinating way. So, like Lord Harry, remember he's speculating. His <clears throat> wife will die. And so he has one son with his wife, um, Matilda, <coughs> who begats a man known as Henry Lee the Fourth. And we're gonna get to him because he's really juicy. We'll get to him in a moment, but I want to tell you that um, he then marries, after the death of his wife, um, Anne Hill Carter. Now, I don't know if you all know about Anne Hill Carter, but she was born at Shirley Plantation. She came with this huge uh, uh, trust fund, which Hill Carter knew that Light Horse Harry was fast with his money. So he has it in trust that Her Light Horse Harry cannot get a hold of it. Anyway, his debts become so great that in 1809, he has to abandon uh, Stratford Hall 
Anne Hill Carter moves to Alexandria. You can visit the house or look at the house where they lived at that time. Robert E. Lee remembers the last thing he remembers of Stratford Hall was kissing the angels that were part of the fireplace in his bedroom. So, wow, you know, that's a great memory. And he kissed them both and then said goodbye. So, because Henry, or Light Horse Harry Lee, was so much in debt that the house passed to his son from his first marriage, who happened to be known as Henry Lee the Fourth. Now, let me finish with Light Horse Harry. So he gets so in debt, he actually goes to debtor's prison. When he gets out of debtor's prison, right, he's still in debt. He goes to Baltimore. This is riots are happening at the beginning of the War of 1812. He gets knocked over the head and badly injured. The debtors, the people he owes money to, are chasing after him. So what does he do? He moves to the West Indies. He says for his health, but actually to escape the debtors or the debts. And so he will finally come back, but he will die at Cumberland Island, deeply in debt and not mourned by many, especially his wife. Now, we mentioned his son from his first marriage, and his name was Henry Lee the Fourth. Now, Henry Lee the Fourth um, will. Uh, actually um, marry a woman named Matilda Lee. And she dies. And so then he marries a, a woman named Anne Robertson McCarty. And of course, he becomes ward of his sister Elizabeth. Now, let me tell you that uh, Margaret has a child who dies in a tragic accident in uh, 1820. And when I say tragic, it is a tragic uh, carriage accident. And so she goes into depression. And what does she do? Well, when you get depressed back in the early 1900s, you take laudanum, which is opium. So she becomes an opium eater, as we will say, or an opium addict. And so there's Elizabeth just 18. He has all this money for Elizabeth. He is Elizabeth, his ward. And so since his wife was an opium addict, his affections turned to whom? Elizabeth. And with Elizabeth, not only uh, does he have this toward affair with, uh, he also gets her pregnant. Now, they're all in Stratford Hall. There's an opium addict upstairs. Here's this lovely young girl, which Lee is charge of her finances. Well, guess what he did? He took all those finances, those monies given by uh, her father, McCarty, to support his daughter. He spends it all on supporting Stratford Hall. I mean, he is a spendthrift of the highest order. And so, so much so that when Elizabeth becomes pregnant and she gives birth in the upstairs room in Stratford Hall and the baby is never seen again, it disappeared. So because he's having an affair, because his wife is an opium addict, because he's a spendthrift, he gets sued by the McCarthy family. And as a result of that, he loses Stratford Hall, which goes to Elizabeth McCarthy, right? And she will live there until 1878. I mean, it is amazing how uh, uh, the turn, tried or turns. Well, you know what the nickname of Henry Lee the fourth was Black Horse Henry Lee is kind of a play on Light Horse Henry Lee, you know, Black Horse because yeah, he's got some dark things. Now his wife, uh, when Elizabeth is showing as pregnant, she will abandon Stratford Hall and she becomes friends with Andrew Jackson and his wife Rachel. Oh my gosh. So when all this, this lawsuit will be taken against Black Horse Harry and he loses, where to go? Well, he goes out to Tennessee and 
Andrew Jackson tries to rehabilitate him. He makes him a speechwriter for him. He, I got to tell you, Black Horse Harry Lee had wrote three very outstanding books. One about the Southern campaigns during the American Revolution, where his father was involved. Another one was Observations of the Writings of Thomas Jefferson, his third cousin to remove. Uh, and then he wrote one of the Life of Napoleon. So he's a writer. He actually writes Andrew Jackson's inaugural address. And oh my gosh, Jackson really loves him. So in 1832, after Lee writes the second inaugural address, Jackson will name him to be um, ambassador to Algiers. Well, this is, a, this is a great way to recover from being, you know, married to an opium addict, having an affair with her sister. I mean, those are all bad things. And also being a spendthrift. And so Congress, however, they don't forget the court case. They don't forget what he did to Elizabeth. They blame him for his wife becoming an opium addict. So what's going to happen with Lee? He does not. Congress says, no, we don't agree that he can take that appointment. No, not many people said no to Andrew Jackson, I got to tell you. So, you know, he had a lot of these problems, so to speak. And as a result of that, uh, he will go move to Paris where he will die in 1836. Uh, so, uh, so is the tragic life of Black Horse Harry Lee. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's odd when you think of the Lee family, you don't think, you think, oh my gosh, these people are immensely wealthy. They build the most unusual house in colonial Virginia, uh, uh, Stratford Hall, that uh, uh, they have lots of money. Well, actually, they didn't have that much money when it came down to Henry Lee III. And what money he had through his wives and his, I guess you would call his ward, Elizabeth, um, he spends it all, speculates and what have you. So uh, Black Horse Harry Lee goes down as I think one of my favorite story about the Lees, because you have got to realize you know, when you think of the Lees, Richard Henry Lee, signer of the Declaration of Independence, uh, member, uh, president of the 12th Continental Congress. Oh, I, the list goes on. His Henry or Black Horse Harry Lee's half brother is guess whom? Robert Edward Lee, you know, he mentioned that name in Virginia and he goes, oh my gosh. But anyway, you can see that not everyone turns out right in life. And uh, so he lives in abject poverty in uh, uh, Paris and uh, dies there. So now the real crook of it all in, uh, during the 18th century in Virginia is a man known as John Robinson. I want to tell you about John Robinson. He was born in 1704 into a very wealthy family. His father, right, becomes a, uh, uh, actually uh, became a member of the governor's council. He also was acting governor of Virginia in 1749. They've amassed six different plantations. The main plantation is known as Pleasant Hill on the Mattapani River. I got to tell you, this guy is considered the wealthiest man in Virginia and also the most astute politician in Virginia. He becomes a member of the Generalists or the House of Burgesses in 1826, right? So that makes him a little over 22 years old. Uh, he amasses great power immediately so that by 1738, he is named Speaker of the House of Burgesses. Now that is a tremendous position, but yet I'm going to tell you what else he gets named. He is named Treasurer of Virginia. Now you would think being named Treasurer of Virginia is something that's pretty good. But I'm going to tell you right now, uh, he takes advantage of his position. Now, how does he do so? Well, back in colonial Virginia, we had a process that we knew as, um, you know, basically printing currency 
to pay debts. And when the debt is paid in full, that piece of currency is to be burned. However, Robinson, when he collected those notes, instead of burning them, guess what he did? He kept them and he loaned money to all his pals. In fact, let me just go down a list of some of the pals he loans money to. Archibald Carey, 4,000 pounds. William Byrd the third, 15,000 pounds. Carter Braxton, signer of the Declaration of Independence, 3,256 pounds. He actually, with Governor, now Governor Fauquier, everyone's kind of worried about Robinson, right? Because Robinson is wealthy, he's politically powerful. He's more powerful in many ways than the governor. And no one can seem to touch him. Actually, Fauquier said this about Robinson, the most popular man in the country, beloved by the gentleman and the idol of the people, so that he is absolutely sure of the chair as long as he pleases to fill it. In other words, he is the greatest guy in the colony. He's the wealthiest guy in the colony, but his wealth is based on paper and not on reality because he's dipping into the treasury of Virginia, loaning money to his friends, using notes that are supposed to be destroyed. Then he hooks up with Governor Fauquier and John Chiswell and William Byrd, now remember, William Byrd owes him 15,000 pounds, which today would be probably <clears throat> around a uh, million dollars. So, you know, that's a lot. So what's going to happen is, is that Byrd is going to join with Robinson and the governor of Virginia to actually own Lead Mine Company in with Virginia, the only source of lead in Virginia, and they create shares using, guess what, those paper certificates that were supposed to be destroyed, and so instead, this is Virginia's money. Now, I have to tell you, when, on, you know, suddenly, uh, good old John Robinson dies, and this is a shock to everything and everyone. Edmund Pendleton becomes executor of the state. And as he goes through the, uh, the records, he is shocked to find that John Robinson owed 100,000 pounds to the Commonwealth of Virginia. That's like $100 million today. Okay, so just get that idea of how Robinson, using his political power, had loaned money to the elite of Virginia, keeping them afloat after the Depression of 1764. That's caused by the end of the French and Indian War. So he's loaning money to everyone, but it's not his money to loan. And so basically, Edmund Pendleton has to name a surety bond of 250,000 pounds, and he makes people like William Byrd, Carter Braxton, all sign surety. And it takes them until 1808 to completely settle his estate. They sell his 400 slaves, they sell his plantations. In other words, Robinson went from being the most esteemed and wealthiest person in Virginia, but the day he dies, he has such a darkened past that no one can forgive him for the wrongs he did, the colony, the rights he did to the elite, and the elite all had to pay that money back. William Byrd III has to sell part of his property at the falls of um, the James River, uh, and he actually creates the town of Richmond, right? The selling, he has a lottery, he's so desperate to pay back the 15,000 pounds, and he actually will go bankrupt uh, because of his own ill-advised finances, I guess is the best way to express it. So um, I think that is one of the biggest financial scandals. This would, I think you all remember Enron, don't you? You know, I certainly do. And that what a financial scandal that was. Well, guess what? John Robinson 
was bad news throughout the 13 colonies and all the way back to England. You know, I got to tell you, his father's brother was the Bishop of London. So he had all these protections around him, but then he dies and no one's there to pick up the pieces to keep those secrets hidden. So that's the story of John Robinson. Uh, if you ever know someone who's a spendthrift, just say, don't be like John Robinson. You know, that's what they used to say back then. So um, I'm going to go to another great story. Uh, you know, scandals. I, 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 I try not to tell these uh, in a naughty way, but I could. Um, but instead, I'm going to tell you about the Huntington family. And I like to talk about the Huntington family. I've done all this research about them because, you know, I'm uh, connected with the Mariners Museum. And as a result of that, uh, one Huntington, Archer Milton Huntington, was the founder of the Mariners Museum. Consequently, um, you know, good to pay attention to who they were. Now, the first one I'm going to talk about is a man known as Collis Potter Huntington. Oh, my gosh. Uh, Huntington was born in abject poverty. He becomes a Yankee peddler at 16. He actually goes, and you know what a Yankee peddler was? He was kind of a shyster. He'd take clocks through the country and little things that most people couldn't get. They didn't have Walmart back then, okay? So he was a traveling Walmart, so to speak. And so he actually comes down to Newport News Point, goes, wow, I'm going to have this place someday. Nevertheless, goes to California with the gold rush. But you know what? He didn't go there to pan for any gold. He went there because he brought materials, equipment that all the gold miners needed. And so he becomes a millionaire along with his partner, Mark Hopkins, um, just overnight. And so they invest, now they're in Sacramento, California, they invest in what is known as the Central Pacific Railroad, the first railroad in California. Instead of bringing the gold down the river, Sacramento River, which was difficult to do, you could do it <clears throat> in half a day by using the railroad. So the railroad, you know, has fees and they make this money hand over fist. And as a result of that, and he becomes extremely rich. In fact, his company, the Central Pacific, will be tasked with building the Transcontinental Railway. Oh my goodness. And at the same time, he's building the Transcontinental Railway, he borrows money from the government and got all these shareholders, and he builds what's known as the Southern Pacific. Now, if you know anything about Huntington, whatever he does, he tries to control everything around him. So the Southern Pacific comes uh, all the way from New Orleans to Los Angeles. Oh, my goodness. He buys up all this property. And where is going to be the port of, San of Los Angeles? Well, what he does, he brings the tracks up to what land he owns across from the existing port known as San Pedro, and he refuses to allow shipments on his railroad to go to San Pedro. So his port, the port of Los Angeles, becomes the port we know today. It's called the Port War. And uh, uh, Huntington, let me tell you about Huntington. You know, um, he... There's some other, I'm, I'm going to tell another great story about him, but one of his financial managers was a man known as David Colton. And David Colton kept all these financial records, and guess what happened? You know, um, Colton drops dead at his desk, and as a result of that, uh, you know, everyone comes in, oh my gosh, and they open up with this one drawer that's been locked, and in there, is all this intimate correspondence between, um, you know, CP and Colston about all the goings on financially of the Southern Pacific Railroad, the Union Pacific Railroad, the, the Central Pacific Railroad, and the Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad. 
oh my gosh, this is so amazing. Now this, what we learn about Huntington, now up to this date, Huntington's like, wow, you're a great dude. You know, you build all these railways, you build towns, you built Huntington, West Virginia, he built Newport News, Virginia, and all of a sudden the scandal comes out. In fact, uh, one newspaper said that this was a tremendous embarrassment, that it was showed how Huntington did his work. He was so active, he was profane and cynical uh, as a promoter of railroads. He displayed his eagerness to use money to bribe congressmen. What did he do? Well, you get all these loans from the government and the government expects them to pay them off. So what you do is you bribe a bunch of congressmen so that they'll say, well, you don't have to repay that loan for 15 more years or we'll call, cancel that debt because you've done such a great service to America. And they're doing that because Huntington's, you know, there's this one cartoon by Thomas Nass that shows Congress with Huntington speaking before them, and they all have little signs, my vote for $5,000, my vote for $25,000, and so forth. So in other words, he was as corrupt as they came as a railroad builder. Now, Huntington doesn't care, you know, because he got his way, although he will have to pay back some of those loans after all, and because uh, they cancel the cancellation of the loans. So Huntington doesn't pay those things off until 1909. Actually, that's done by his nephew, Henry uh, Huntington. So what's going to transpire is that Collis, you know, when you build the Transcontinental Railway, the Southern Pacific, what are you going to do next? It's all about, you know, I have an adage, it's not what you've done, it's what you do next that counts, okay? And that's exactly what Huntington does. So he's looking around for something to do. He's lured to Richmond, Virginia, by Major Williams Carter Wickham, um, a wealthy railroader, a major during the Civil War in the Confederate Army. He owned the Virginia Central Railway, which went from R Richmond all the way to Lexington. It was supposed to reach then all the way to Tennessee. War comes, guess what happens to the railroad? Huh, those tracks are torn up. Uh, the railroad iron, uh, extra iron is taken over by the Confederacy to build ironclads, to build guns. So his fortune in his railroad is now defunct. In fact, the Virginia Central was preparing to go into bankruptcy. Oh my gosh. However, Wickham says to Huntington, I want you to come. I want you to look at this. Your investment will revive this railroad. Well, Huntington comes to Richmond and he stays in this boarding house down in near Shaco Slip. I think you all know where that is. And in that boarding house, the boarding house is the Yarrington house. And it just so happens the daughter of Mrs. Yarrington is Arabella Duval Yarrington. Now she is one cutie. She is 18 years old when Collis Potter Huntington shows up in Richmond and he takes a look at her. She takes a look at him. Now you got to realize she is 18 years old at this time. Huntington is in his fifties. He's married. His wife is up in New York. And so guess what? Uh, for some odd reason, um, he buys the CNO. So he has an excuse to be in Richmond because good old Belle, as she likes to be called, becomes Huntington's mistress. Oh my gosh, you know? How torrid could that be? Well, I'm gonna get it even more torrid because she has a child. So then he gets one of his, I guess, creatures. Remember, you know, the people that work for Cardinal Richelieu were all called his creatures. Well, Huntington had those as well. So what's gonna happen is that uh, Huntington will have Bell married off to Edward Warsham, right, who is dying of cancer, okay, and so they get married, and he dies um, before the son is born, who's going to be known as Archer Milton Warsham at first, but then he gets adopted by guess whom? Collis Potter Huntington, his real father. 
And then when his wife dies, he marries Belle and they have this grand extravagant life. You know, they're great philanthropists. Uh, you know, just know about uh, Huntington University here. You think about uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art. They're big art collectors. They give it all away, right? They're just having fun. In fact, Bell, when C.P. Huntington dies, <clears throat> is going to be the wealthiest woman in America. Whoa, that's pretty hot, isn't it? I can tell you what's going to happen is that uh, Bell has this big estate, and basically, uh, Collis divides his estate in three parts one to Bell, of course, one to Archer, of course, his adopted son, as we like to say, uh, and the third goes to his nephew, his factorum, Henry Edwards Huntington known as Eddie by all. He has become a real estate developer in uh, Los Angeles. He creates the Oak Hill section. He creates Huntington Beach. He has streetcars. He owns the streetcar system in San Francisco. He owns the streetcar system in Yellow Line and Red Line in Los Angeles. Oh my gosh, he has options of stock and railroads, everything. I mean, this guy is brilliant. He follows in the footsteps of his uncle, CP. Actually, when he graduated from college, Eddie uh, graduated from uh, Columbia. And so when he graduates, he's in New York and he runs into his uncle and the uncle says, I know you're starting out in business. I will give you $10,000. And Eddie thinks about it for just a second, says, oh no, I'm going to work for you to earn that money. And that impresses Collis P because everyone wanted his money. Uh, so as a result of that, Eddie becomes not only inheriting a third of CP's money, but he's also the trustee of Archer's money and Arabella's money. Well, I gotta tell you that Henry is married to Mary Prentice. And Mary Prentice's sister, Martha Prentice, was adopted by Huntington. So Eddie got to meet uh, Mary Prentice through the adoptive daughter, and he marries Mary Prentice, and they have four children. They're kind of happy and everything. However, let me tell you. You know, Belle was quite a creature, uh, a woman of tremendous beauty, uh, tremendous style, attributes, taste, you name it. She could speak French, she could speak Spanish, uh, she and French, let me tell you, she was just brilliant. But what's gonna happen is that Eddie starts spending a little too much time over at Belle's house instead of going home. In fact, he takes Bell and Archer on a trip to Spain. Well, you know, if I was Mary Prentice, I would start to think, hmm, what's going on here? Well, what's going on there is that Bell and Eddie are having a affair. Oh my gosh, can you believe it? And so Mary Prentice sues for the divorce. She gets it. Eddie doesn't care. And so what happens next is that when Mary Prentice dies in 1913, <clears throat> 30 days after her death, Eddie will marry Belle in San Francisco. High society is appalled. But how can you be but so appalled at one of the wealthiest people in wealthiest families in America? Uh, so the Huntingtons, despite all the good they did, they had a lot of people whispering behind them because of Archer, because of Henry and CP. Despite the goodness they did, um, they actually did a lot of wrong. Well, anyway, I was supposed to talk for 30 minutes, but obviously I went beyond that. And uh, uh, so does anyone, um, uh, debt holders are called creditors back then, yes. Um, uh, at least the western portion Union Pacific built the eastern portion. Yes, they met at Utah. Um, so uh, uh, Huntington will eventually acquire the Union Pacific uh, by default by 
um, William Durant, uh, who goes bankrupt, goes, actually goes to jail for falsifying stock. Um, so, uh, and Huntington's not even there at the Golden Spike, I have to tell you, because he's busy with the Southern Pacific, which is a competitor to the uh, Transcontinental Railway. So, any other questions? John, I got a couple of questions that were actually sent to me by email. And just uh, in case anybody joined us late, if you would like to um, send a question, you can go ahead and down to the bottom of your screen, click on the chat button over in the right hand corner. You can type in a question. Um, I have one question for you. Somebody was asking, how did um, Sally Hemings? Um, no, hold on. How did Light Horse Harry Lee get his name? Because he was a brilliant, he was. Oh, I think you just cut out there for a second. Let me see if we can get you back. I'm not sure what happened. Um, you okay. un you unmuted me. Okay, say that again. How did Light Horse Harry? Uh, Light Horse Harry Lee got his nickname because he his Lee's Legion was mostly oh, yeah, right. cavalry oh, instead question. of heavy cavalry like hussars and dragoons. So he's named Light Horse Harry as saying he's the best at handling light cavalry during the Revolutionary War for the Americans. Um, okay, I got a question in the chat box. At what point did he develop Newport News? Well, you know, he acquires um, the uh, um, Virginia Central Railway. He comes up with an idea that what he's going to do is he's going to connect it to Cleveland and he's going to have an Atlantic terminus. So in other words, this great goal of, of canal makers was to connect to the Great Lakes so then you were connected to the Mississippi, you were connected to um, all this commerce, all these goods, you've got raw materials coming east with finished materials heading west. Now, he's gotta pick his, um, his Atlantic terminus. Now, if you know anything about Huntington, I'll tell you one story about him that's gonna explain it. Uh, so he's out there in West Virginia trying to find his major town uh, uh, to uh, cross the Ohio River, right? And it's all part of this connection that he's making. Well, it just so happens that uh, he goes to this town called French Lick, and which is a no-account town, but it's right on the river. Uh, he meets, he goes into the saloon, ties up his horse, right? and goes into a saloon to meet with the mayor and the other officials. Well, it just so happens while he's in there, his horse will kind of get up on the boardwalk and, you know, he relieves himself, okay? And makes a big mess on the boardwalk. The sheriff of the town gives him a ticket, right? For defamation or defecation of the city boardwalk and, Huntington, when he goes out and sees this ticket, he goes back in, he has a $5 gold piece, and he flips it at the mayor, says that's the last piece of gold you'll ever see from C.P. Huntington. He goes 13 miles up river, and what does he create? Huntington, West Virginia. They got wealthy because wherever Collis went, he had second industries to support his railroad. So in Huntington, that's where he set up a business making freight cars and coal cars and box cars. Actually there, they will create the first refrigerated car because Collis, when he brings the line down, no one, there's nothing in Newport News at Newport News Point in uh, 1877. Uh, why? Well, there's just not, you know, it's after the war. Hampton is booming a little more. And so Huntington starts to buy up all the land under his Old Dominion Land Company. Uh, he actually um, is so smart. Let me tell you what he and Eddie would do. They would go create a town. Then they would create the gas works, which they own. Then they create the electric works. 
which they own. Then they create the waterworks because if you're going to have a successful city, what do you have to have? Water. So Huntington owns the streets. He owns the houses, which he sells. He owns the main business, the railroads. He owns the water. He owns everything, right? And then what's going to be his secondary industry that he creates in Newport News? Well, it's the largest privately owned shipyard in the world, Newport News Shipbuilding. So Huntington is one slick dude. He picks Newport News because the land is there. At first, they thought he was going to pick Yorktown. And actually, he lays tracks to Yorktown so that when they celebrate the 100th anniversary of the victory at Yorktown in 1881, they all can go there by train. However, he doesn't want Yorktown being a competitor to his Newport News, so he tears up the track the next day, and Yorktown, you know, at that time starts to falter as a town, whereas Newport News becomes this tremendous city. Um, so uh, he developed Newport News beginning in 1877 by buying up the land. The town will be incorporated um, as a town within Warwick County in 1881. It becomes an independent city in 1896, and then it consolidates with the rest of Warwick County in 1957. So, you know, that's why we have Newport News as we have today. Um, so the other question, after all my research, oh my gosh, could you conclude that financially successful individuals tend to have checkered or complicated lives in general? Hmm. Let's just think about that. Uh, and the answer is yes, of course, because the object when you get that wealthy is to control more and more and more. Nothing is enough, right? Uh, today we have the Koch brothers, or just one is left now, but, um, you know, they are trying to control everything. They've got politicians under their strings that force different tax laws, that do everything that gets rid of EPA. I mean, they are underhanded. And the way they do that is by legal, so to speak, contributions to super PACs and as well as uh, someone running for office. So through the super PACs, they actually can say to Congressman Horstein, hey, you know, we're gonna give your campaign this much money. And by the way, we have a favor to ask of you. You know that great line, I have a favor to ask. Uh, that's kind of like mafioso, but you know, in other words, I don't want EPA laws because I want to drill oil everywhere I can, so forth. So yes, they have very checkered past. Um, in fact, uh, uh, there's some like Rockefeller who was unscrupulous in business, but he didn't have affairs. He didn't have. Uh, you know, he gave money to church. He created Colonial Williamsburg just to start with. Um, restored William and Mary. Um, so I would have to say that their past have to be checkered because of how they amass so much money. And uh, um, during the revolution, Lighthorse Harry Lee and George Washington, look, let me tell you, they are both from the Northern Neck. Okay, Mount Vernon, right, is between, it's on the Potomac. Stratford Hall is on the Potomac. So in other words, these are all part of the Virginia elite. So they knew each other and Washington trusted Lee, in fact, gave him some very important positions during the war, including being head of cavalry, for Nathaniel Green, who led the uh, Carolina campaign that forced your Lord Cornwallis to Yorktown and victory, right? So they knew each other very well. Um, you know, Washington was also a land speculator. The big thing is he, um, he was a surveyor and he surveyed for uh, Francis Fauquier, the 
governor of Virginia and also for Lord Fairfax. And so whenever Fairfax was you know, buying up land, George Washington would buy up some with him and the, so they would develop it. And so he was kind of on the string when he gets to marry Mary Dandridge Custis. Now, just that name is like magical because Custis were the wealthiest people in Virginia in 1760. Um, okay. And what I mean by wealthy, I mean wealthy. Um, they came to uh, uh, Virginia in the 1680s over on the Eastern shore. You actually go to the gravesite of one of the members of the Custis families called Arlington. That's why the house up near Washington is called what? Arlington. So when her husband, Daniel Park Custis, dies, guess what? George steps in. He had tall, six foot four, handsome. Yeah, he's got false teeth, but that's okay you know, and so they get married, you know, false teeth back then are amazing. I got to tell you, you know, after the Battle of Waterloo, um, people went through the battlefield taking out the teeth of all the dead people, and I know that sounds gross. However, in England, they sold a style of denture called Waterloo dentures, okay, just figure that one out. And uh, so anyway, uh, so the relationship between Lee and Washington is good. Um, Line Horse Harry doesn't go really bad until after Washington's death. So, you know, up to um, Washington's death. And actually, who gave the eulogy at Washington's funeral? Light Horse Harry Lee. Okay. So they were pals. Um, uh, Spark, yes. I think we are good. We, we, you have been graciously given us your time and we've had some great questions. Um, thank you everybody for joining us. Wow. This has been really fun. Um, we always look to John to entertain us. So we're going to have another five weeks of them. We have a six week series. Um, next week we'll be talking about the Southampton insurrection. And that is just really, really interesting. I, I specifically asked for it because I heard it once a few years back and wanted to hear it again. Um, wanted to also mention that if anybody is interested in finding out more about the Mariners Museum, um, their website is marinersmuseum.org. Please go on and check out what they have going on. John is actually doing some other um, series and some virtual uh, tours and uh, uh, presentations, so check that out on there. Um, and if you want to sign up or have friends that want to sign up for any of the remaining Sally classes, you can go to our website, which is senioradvocate.live. Again, senioradvocate.live. And you can go on there and check out what we have coming up. Um, John, any last words for us? Well, I want to thank you all for uh, putting up with my stories, and uh, I hope you all enjoyed them uh, as well as I enjoyed delivering them for you all. History is so much a part of us everywhere, and the more we pay attention to our past, the better our future will be. So, huzzah, and thank you. Thank you, John. We're going to say bye to everyone and show the screen of all of our participants. I think we had 51 at one time. so. Thanks, guys, for joining us. We look forward to seeing you on the next one. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.